When disaster strikes, we tend to think in terms of numbers. For example, we say that over $7 billion in damage has been done by Hurricane Sally, or that the Dow has dropped by 500 points. And even on a smaller scale, a more human scale, we use numbers. We say, for example, that four buildings have been destroyed in a town from a wildfire, or that salaries were cut by 15%, and so on. We live in a world obsessed with numbers, yet we seem to ignore the most pressing numbers of our time. We have somewhere around 420 gigatons of CO2 left to emit in order to limit warming to the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. That means that only a few years after I graduate from university in 2025, we may have already surpassed the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark and be climbing to two degrees Celsius of global warming, a level at which the damage done will be irreversible. No one seems to be listening to these numbers. So to honor the scientists who worked tirelessly to come up with them and to save millions of lives, we need to think beyond numbers. We need to emphasize the cost of the climate crisis to actual human lives and livelihoods. And that means talking about another crisis we are currently facing, that of mental health. When you ask the average American what unique crises millennials and Gen Z are facing that previous generations dealt with far less often, two answers tend to emerge, the mental health crisis and the climate crisis. Yet somehow, the two issues almost seem to be separated by an or, rather than an and. One gets the sense that the mental health epidemic and all that initiated it, from social media to academic pressure to fierce competition, is a current problem, one that our generation will face only as teenagers. The climate crisis, in comparison, is usually painted as the problem of our mid to late adulthoods, not yet bad enough to be a current issue, but one we will later realize, mainly through numbers, through things like tanking economies and fewer fish, and destroyed property. I am here to say that this unspoken assessment is completely incorrect, because the mental health crisis is not going away. It will in fact be worsened by what is happening to our planet. And the climate crisis itself is already happening, sending tens of thousands into depression and despair. When I started to discover the urgency and the severity of global warming, I felt a negative shift in my own mental well-being. As a result, I searched the internet for any connection of climate change and mental health I could find, and came up mostly empty-handed. Mental health articles talked about college admissions, but not about climate. Climate articles talked about property damage, but not about mental health. A few wonderful bloggers had discussed eco-anxiety, and professional mental health associations are beginning to talk about it but the talk remains in its infancy. Why, I wondered, was this topic so obscure when I would have thought it an obvious concern? After a few months, the answer came to me. The culture of the global north has turned us away from this conversation. I live, and many of you live, in a capitalist society, one where success is personal and once again defined numerically. The focus is not on the collective, but on the self. What can I do to get ahead? How do I make money? Am I doing well? It follows that the way we discuss mental health is based around our economic system. Poor mental health, as the global north sees it, is often defined as a barrier to personal success in the economy. For example, if a teenager suffers from depression, that is concerning because their grades might drop and they'll have trouble getting into college. If an adult has bipolar, that is a barrier they must resolve with their boss in order to keep their job. The cures, too, are centered on small, personal actions. I saw a meme the other day. In it, a fictional client was listing their struggles from inability to afford rent to an uninsured but life-saving surgery. The therapist responds, this is all very normal. Have you tried meditation? Don't get me wrong, self-care definitely has its place, 
but when faced with outright denials of basic human rights and a horrifying crisis of the powerful endangering the most affected people in areas, deep breaths alone are not the answer. As a result of this obsession with ourselves, instances of mental distress centered outside of oneself, in sympathy and empathy for others, are generally, in the global north, frowned upon with puzzlement. I experienced this shift firsthand. At the start of my high school years, my highest priority was maintaining good grades. When I expressed academic stress, I received all sorts of comfort, gifts, hugs, motivational high fives, and heartfelt notes. Then my primary source of distress shifted to the far larger obstacle of the climate crisis, and the reactions I received shifted right along with it. Those who had hugged me before now joked about my obsession with climate change. Those who had written notes of validation now told me that everything was going to be okay, and I didn't have a good reason to worry about the environment. And one by one, the people I trusted began to echo the same comments over and over again. What was the primary comment I heard? Well, our house isn't on fire. We're lucky to be where we are. We're safe. Now come have some pizza. I do not blame my friends and loved ones for responding this way, angry as I felt, because it is how they have been taught to respond, pressed to respond, in a culture that values profit over people, personal success at the expense of united communities. A culture that tells us that yes, marginalized people might matter, human livelihoods might matter, but not as much as the next thing on one's own to-do list. I think I speak for all the youth when I say, we will not accept that message. Furthermore, we truly don't have a choice. If we continue to view empathy for our global neighbors, particularly the most affected people in areas, as foreign or suspicious, then our planet will keep on warming. Sure, we might install a few solar panels and drive more electric cars, but that is not climate justice. And we, here at Mach COP26, demand climate justice. We must amplify the voices of the most affected people and areas. Their words, presented here today in my peers' speeches, are far more crucial to climate justice than any we in the global north could possibly contribute. We must also normalize collective emotional struggle. Humans are social animals, so to invalidate all mental health issues that arise from the state of the world, rather than one's direct position, is just as unnatural as it is harmful. If you are a mental health professional, I implore you to recognize that the usual, the usual solutions and techniques do not apply to the climate crisis. There must be innovation in the profession, innovation that includes validation and an acknowledgement of just how collective this crisis is. And most importantly, we should acknowledge the need for activists to take breaks. People cannot raise their voices day in and day out with no rest. Self-care is not the cure for climate anxiety, but it is a necessary task. If you find it impossible to spend your free time burning fossil fuels, pretending the climate crisis doesn't exist, as it seems like society expects we do, then find ways to align your rest with your goals, just like you do with your action. Maybe that entails cutting your fossil fuel consumption. As NASA scientist Peter Kalmus has done, and described in his book, Being the Change, which I highly recommend. Maybe that's reading All We Can Save, which is an antidote to climate doom, written by women at the forefront of the movement. Maybe that's writing climate fiction, as I do, pouring your emotions, hopes, and dreams into art so that more people join the movement. Individual action alone will not solve the crisis, but I've found it's a helpful way to avoid cognitive dissonance and fight for solutions on every level. Above all, if there is one thing I want you to take away from my words today, it's that if your mental health is declining along with the climate, that is not your fault. If you are not being validated in your struggle, especially, yeah, that is also not your fault. Individual shame and blame is a systemic problem. The more we fight against the polluters who have caused the climate crisis, 
the more we also fight a culture that leaves millions of people depressed and defeated. If we fight hard enough, if we put the most affected people in areas at the forefront of our fight, then perhaps we will no longer be known as the generation suffering from the mental health and climate crises, but as the one that overcame them. Until then, we raise awareness of the connection between the two crises. We take care of ourselves, and we take care of each other. And, most importantly, we get involved. We act now, because the climate crisis is here. Now. Thank you.